Okay, let's get started. Welcome to the Grounding Off-Grid Systems webinar. We are recording the webinar today and we will send you an email tomorrow with a link to that recording. Uh, we've also attached a PDF of the webinar slide deck that we're using today. And that's located in the handout section of your GoToWebinar pane. And we recommend that you go ahead and download that now. During the presentation, we invite you to text any questions in the questions chat section on your GoToWebinar console, and we'll address them at the end of the webinar. So with that's covered, let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide so I can introduce today's presenters. Today's presenters are Roy Butler and Brad Burwald. Roy Butler has over 25 years of design and installation experience with grid tie and off-grid wind electric, solar electric, and solar water pumping systems, as well as 18 years of experience in the residential construction field. And our second speaker, Brad Burwald, has over 20 years of experience supporting off-grid power solutions in telecom, industrial, and rural electrification markets. He's provided training, monitoring, and application support for many Morningstar integrators globally. All right, Roy, I'm going to hand off to you so you can start the presentation. Thank you, Mark, and welcome, everybody. Uh, just a real quick note that I, I feel is uh, necessary to put out there that uh, this is a very complex subject. Uh, one of the jokes in the industry is you put five experts in a room, you will get six opinions on grounding, but the uh, we will give a basic overview of grounding and bonding. Uh, a lot of these segments of this, uh, of this presentation uh, could probably comprise a 40-hour course, so this will be a 10,000-foot uh, overview here. So the, it's important to note here that there's a difference between grounding for electrical safety and grounding for lightning protection. Uh, safety grounding is employed to prevent electrical shock hazards by grounding exposed metal parts that may become energized due to various faults. Uh, grounding for lightning protection is used on metal structures to dissipate to ground the induced voltage and the current from a nearby lightning strike before it can reach damaging levels. And as you can see here, uh, we're showing the uh, the grounding of the battery uh, on the negative side. Uh, that can also be on a positive ground system that would be grounded on the positive side. And uh, you can find an awful lot of information, uh, maybe more than you want, but nevertheless, it's there in the National Electric Code uh, in Article 250, a uh, very, very comprehensive article in the National Electric Code. Next slide, slide please. And here's one grounding uh, one, of it, one grounding example. This is a grounding electrode. Uh, this is a very, very common earth ground. There are many other methods used to achieve a good earth ground. And we'll cover some of those a bit further on in this webinar. Next. Okay. I will take it away and also cover uh, one of the other major aspects of our presentation, which is bonding. And we're talking about grounding and bonding together because they're highly related but serve extremely different purposes in the system uh, in terms of you know, what, what the actual strategy behind them are. So in the case of bonding, uh, when you have you know, proper grounding in place, you've got your system ground, and as Roy said, you're looking to you know, dissipate or hopefully prevent as much as possible damage from lightning. Bonding is ensuring that a lot of the metallic components of the system, uh, not so much the, the system components itself, like charge controllers and batteries and wiring, but that the chassis, that the uh, metallic you know, conduit surrounding the system, that all that is connected together to provide an adequate flow to ground if they were inadvertently electrified. So an example would be when you've got a, an enclosure, you've got a lot of wiring and equipment. Over time, as we know, you know, systems comes loose, especially if they're moving. We've got RVs, boat, mobile applications all covered within the solar industry, and things happen. Wires go astray, connections are made, maybe quarters are a little too tight, and there's a chance of something touching something else that should not. Um, I even had a, a recent installation in my home where I smashed everything into a junction box when I was installing a fan switch and the wires, they get pretty close together. So in order to ensure that safety is, is provided in all cases, you want to connect these metallic uh, pieces of equipment together to bond them to be sure that if any of them were to become shorted or, or touch an electrical you know, conductor, that there would be a direct path to ground. If they were not, if they were floating and they became electrified, and there, there was no path to ground, you may actually become the path to ground if you were to touch them. So that bonding process is extremely important and make sure that they're not only connected, but connected well 
with a certain level of conductivity so that if anything is touched, you will get an instant short and the breaker will do its job and immediately trip, which is, is what you want in the system. And here, uh, we're gonna use quite a few photos here because it's best to show these examples uh, you know, in pictures. And here are some examples where you can see there, I'm sure many of you that are professionals in the industry have, have seen this many times, and that's a connection between a door and the actual enclosure, because absolutely the door is required, it's gonna be opened at times, but those hinges alone are not enough, even though they're metallic and they're connected, are not enough to provide a good connection point for conductivity in the case of a, a ground uh, fault event. So here you've got this connection, it's gonna jumper over there, you've got gaskets, you maybe have some less conductive materials used for the hinges that are a little more corrosion resistant, and you're gonna provide that jumper there to make sure that even the door itself is properly bonded. There's another example on the right. We've got some bushings there for conduit. Conduit contains the wires. There could be a, a, a potential path to a, a short there as well. Even in this case, there's a lug right on that bushing that provides uh, a direct connection to the enclosure below. And uh, also in these cases, I'll, I'll show an even better example of this later in the presentation, but you, you may take note that a lot of times there are uh, washers that are like a, a piercing or like a, a star washer that will actually connect through external you know, paint or some kind of a powder coat to ensure that the connection between that terminal goes through any protective coating that is over the enclosure itself. And that's very common as well. Here's a couple more cases. You may see these in industrial installations outside where you've got metal that's joining you know, parts of a fence or in this case, a screen. There's an example with a little bit of corrosion here uh, a few years in, uh, a connection between two metallic points because just because they're butted up against each other, does that not mean that there's a proper connection there? So they had to actually be jumpered across. And then on the right, same exact scenario, you've got some sort of a, a heavy uh, plating that's mounted and there's uh, been a jumper that's been taken across there. One of the most notable examples that I've seen that always draws my curiosity is when I've been traveling at the train station. We go to our engineering office for Morningstar, it's down south, I take Amtrak. And with those overhead power lines, I'm always interested to see fencing, uh, doors, uh, things that are on the station platform that are metallic, all are connected together with these exact type of junctions. And I'm guessing for the same reasons for safety, you've got overhead DC power lines because the trains are often electric and all of that's connected together so that if anything were to come electrified, it would have a good conduction path to ground. Okay, so moving on, proper grounding. So why grounding? Uh, first of all, it's required by many code standards, including the NEC. Uh, a couple of the things that I just mentioned, it ensures that overcurrent devices are working correctly. You do not want a weak connection there because you could have voltage, you could have even some low level current flow that actually could you know, contribute to a fire, but it's not enough to trip the breaker and that's wherein lies the problem. You've got to have a good connection point to ground, you know, high, high opacity, low resistance. Uh, it also enables ground fault protection systems to work. So not only we provide proper grounding, but many times installations will actually have additional electronic components, some very sensitive, which we'll talk about in the future here, uh, that will detect when there is leakage to ground. So just because you provide a safe path, you also want to inform the user or the property that a ground fault has occurred because there could be other things going on that could cause a fire or shock, uh, mainly fire, because a lot of this is, is the NEC is actually directed by the uh, NFPD and they will actually do you know, a lot of this protection to prevent fire. So we're gonna enable ground fault protection as well. And then lastly, to concur with what Roy said, lighting surge protection, you know, a path to ground, hopefully away from you know, sensitive electronics. There's only so much you can do when you have a near or God forbid a direct strike. We've seen some pretty graphic images over our years at Morningstar, but we wanna do everything we can to, uh, to mitigate that. Provides a path away from the equipment, and also um, back away from the, the chassis and the earth grounding is the system grounding. Another need for that is to provide proper grounding, often on the negative terminal, but not always, uh, to make sure that you've got a strong ground zero volt reference for your system so that electronics behave correctly, that everything operates as designed. Again, to refer back to my my newfangled fan switch that had a Wi-Fi control that I installed. Even though a neutral was not previously used in the system, the new one needed both a neutral and a ground connection because now we've got three or even five volt electronics inside of that switch. For them to do their thing correctly, they need a true ground, which was not really needed in the previous uh, switch that was in place from, from decades ago. 
Okay, so to go into a little further detail on equipment ground versus system grounding, um, in a system ground, that's what I was referring to, you want a nice zero volt potential. Uh, we typically use negative terminal grounding for most of our systems. It is not required. The equipment will still operate correctly, but it is highly recommended. Um, if its system is not grounded, it's considered floating. Um, and that means that the system might actually drift up in terms of voltage on that terminal. It's not a pure you know, zero volt connection, but as long as the difference between the two terminals is correct, then everything will still operate well. But we do recommend a, a negative ground. Um, the other thing is that Morningstar's products, they are designed for that because we actually provide our power electronics control. In other words, when we have a charge controller and it chooses to charge or not charge the battery or regulate current, that control circuitry is in the positive leg of the system, okay? So internally on the board, the negatives are all connected together, but the positives, that's where we have our MOSFETs and transistors and maybe even IGBTs or other larger format power electronics, they switch in the positive leg. So for that reason, that's why we, we prefer the negative ground. Now telecom, uh, which we'll discuss in future slides, often is the reverse. They will want a positive ground system, okay? And we'll go into a little more detail, but uh, that kind of generally states how our products are handled. So a little bit more on the quality connection. So I had mentioned before about piercing the, the enclosure or the chassis to make sure you've got a good connection. This is actually a close-up photo of our ground terminal inside of a TriStar charge controller. So you can see here, it's on the back, the circuit board's above it. This is separate from the negative battery terminal connection. We expect that you know both will be grounded later, but we always isolate the electronics from the chassis ground itself. So in this case, we've got a very sizable terminal uh, that is put into the back of the enclosure. This has a powder coating for corrosion resistance and long life for the product, and it also looks a lot nicer on the TriStars chassis. But because of that, there's a special spot where we will mask the powder coating, and then we'll later put this terminal, and you can see there is also a piercing washer there for excellent connection to the metal of the enclosure of the TriStar, so that when it's grounded, you're gonna get a solid connection. And we actually do a high pot test, and this is part of it. When we do that, we put high voltage across the chassis, we make sure, and, and the controller, we make sure that no voltage is going where it should not, that all of our insulation and isolation levels are correct, and that if anything's gonna fail, it does it at this time during the burn-in test of our QA process and not later on in the field. So that's part of this as well. Uh, and as I mentioned, yeah, the star washers and these terminals. Uh, and also while we will use a lot of, you know, corrosion resistance on our terminals, we always ensure that, the, you know, the conductivity is still uh, maintained in the system. Okay, so moving on. So positive grounding requirements. So as I said, we negative terminal bond or ground most of our equipment, but in the case of a lot of telecom, a positive ground system is used. So everyone always asks, why is this? And I've researched this many times over the years. And to put it as simply and as clearly as I can, when there was a lot of buried copper from the old central office phone system, Ma Bell, and all that copper was underground and you had not the greatest insulation, but it was buried, uh, they found that there was a chance with a negative ground system for metals to be actually pulled from the conductive wires. So it would cause the wires to corrode. This goes back to some chemistry. There's there's a lot that has to do with uh, its ionic properties and uh, corrosive properties, and uh, more of that will come later. But essentially, you don't want to pull that metal during this corrosion process out of the conductor. They'd actually rather pull it from the ground connection. So they uh, decided that they would reverse the wiring, and it would be a negative 48 volt supply or a positive ground system. So that's where that came from. Feel free to Google it for lots more interesting background. So what that requires is now, you know, you've switched the system. Oftentimes you'll see breakers in the negative connections. You know, it's the same, everything is a mirror image and you will see that the current is actually flowing through the negative side. Okay, and we've actually referenced our grounding document there because this is a really common question that we get or FAQ in our systems is how to deal with impacts of positive grounding. And there's lots of solutions. Our controllers are compatible with it. You just have to be mindful of a few things and do them a little bit differently. But um, you'll see there, it's got a single ground at the battery. Uh, you do not want to ground in two places at the same time with the controllers because that provides a path around our electronics and it can actually cause them to be defeated. Um, 
Typically, two-pole disconnects are very beneficial because you have both negative and positive ground equipment in the same enclosure. You can put breakers on both connections as well as on the array. And uh, these systems are, uh, as I said, uh, extremely common. Now, with that, I know this is quite a diagram, and I'm not going to attempt to explain everything here, but it was the best example we had that was ready-made. So if you can see clearly, I'll try to just point out a few things. So try to try to just look where my cursor is versus where uh, you know the whole system is going. But in this case, we have a positively grounded battery down, down here. You can see there's the positive, and this is actually on a ground. Okay, and then we've got tri-stars in here for both charge control and load control. But the most interesting thing is that we are providing what's called a mixed uh, ground system, okay? So this customer specifically wanted a negative 48 volt supply for larger telecom equipment and a positive 24 volt supply for some smaller ancillary equipment in the same system. This can be done. You just have to be very mindful of what you're doing and what you're connecting and label everything. And if you have DC to DC converters, from 24 to 48, or even back you know, from 48 to 24 in the system, you can provide that mixed uh, system voltage in one system. You just have to be sure that you're using isolated DC to DC converters, and that allows you to get ground points on both sides without shorting anything out or bypassing anything. And you also have to be particularly aware of communications as well, because not just current and power flow in the system, you know, the battery charging, the loads, the solar array, but if you have communications going between TriStars, such as we do with our meter bus comms or with RS-45 for serial communications, you have to be mindful of the grounding that is uh, happening in those devices as well, because they are meant to handle very small amounts of current. And if you were to provide a ground loop, it will often, you'll see current flow through them much more than they're ever designed to handle, and you'll quickly burn out those communication lines. Okay, so all things to take note of. So um, again, in these uh, positive systems, what is often beneficial, so here is our EMC1. This is our ethernet converter. And in this case, we've got breakers on both the positive and negative because the ProStar MPPT is a, a negative ground system and the EMC is designed also for negative ground. If you do have to put in a positive ground connection, you just want to be sure that you are breaking both connections uh, as well, positive and negative in the diagram on the right. Because if you do not, when you have communication connections, such as the RJ11 here, that's in between the EMC1 and the ProStar, you can get current flow over that connection as well. So the solution here is to put both positive and negative breakers between the battery and the controller. And then everything will have um, you know, proper control and power is gonna be flowing in the right direction. Okay. And with that, I will discuss, uh, hand off to, um, I'm sorry, one more slide, and then I'll be handing off to Roy to take the next section. Um, one other thing that I mentioned before is this is a simple circuit diagram that shows the connection to the battery. And this is actually the, the internals of, say, a ProStar charge controller. We have the microprocessor. We have our, our PWM control algorithm, our day-night algorithm. Uh, we have our load control. And these uh, here at the top, these are all transistors with the arrow one, two, three, there might be several in parallel, but that is the connection point where they are in the circuit. And you can see that here's the PV positive, here's the, uh, the battery positive connecting here, and then here is the load positive, also connecting with the battery. And these MOSFETs are switching in the positive leg. So with our negative connection, everything is grounded and internally connected. So one negative is the same as any other negative, they're common. Uh, but in the positive side, we can isolate and turn power on and off with the uh, the transistors in the positive leg. So the reason I'm explaining this is this is a good example of why if you ever have to switch grounds, you have to be sure that you do not provide a ground path around the positives because these transistors, you'll essentially bypass them. You'll take away the controller's ability to regulate energy. It'll actually throw a fault on the display. It'll say fetch short even though it's not a true fetch short, you're, you're tricking the controller into thinking there's damage because it's seeing the same voltage on the input as the output. So it thinks the FET has actually shorted through, but it's really, you've provided a ground loop around the system and it's disabled. But if you remove that, it'll resume normal operation. And you'll see things like this covered in our other diagrams. Okay, so with that, I will hand off these slides to Roy. Thanks, Roy. Thank you, Brad.
So we're going to move on to ground faults now. Uh, and what is a ground fault? It's basically an unintentional electrical path between a power source and ground. Uh, lots of different uh, ways to detect this, which we'll get onto here in just a second. But basically, you can see in this diagram down toward the bottom in the box on the right that there's an alternative path to ground from the uh, from one of the conductors uh, that's powering that load. And that's really what you don't want because uh, as Brad mentioned previously, uh, many times that will allow a connection between the device and ground through you or through a sensitive piece of equipment, which uh, either way is probably gonna ruin your day. So next slide, please, Brad. So here are some examples of how a ground fault can occur. Um, I like to call a, um, a ground fault similar to pinhole leaks in a garden hose. It's, uh, it's, it doesn't turn off the water, there's still water flow, uh, but a lot of it is finding a different path to where you don't necessarily want it to go. You wanna keep that electricity within the wire, within the insulation. So this really shows the need for uh, the, the conduit adapters to uh, protect the knockouts. I see an awful lot of photos brought in through uh, tech support uh, customers and they show this. I really have no idea why this isn't working properly. And I always cringe when they have the high power conductors coming right through a knockout with no protection at all because due to thermal cycling and, and maybe some mechanical movement, eventually you're gonna wear through that wire against that sharp edge. And uh, if you don't have a short, and you don't have an open, you can have a ground fault, three different conditions there. And ground fault is very, very difficult to track down with a, a, a basic multimeter. You usually typically have to use uh, what we like to call a, uh, a, a megger. And that's, that's actually a brand name like Kleenex and Scotch tape. Uh, it's a meg ohm meter, but megger is a brand name that a lot of us use, where you run a very high voltage signal through the wire uh, that is with the uh, with the wire disconnected at the load end. Uh, you don't want to run 500 or 1,000 volts through your, your load probably, uh, but it will test the pressure, so to speak. It's it's the equivalent of running uh, plumbing lines up to full pressure to see if there's a pinhole leak someplace. And um, so the proper method for pulling through conduit is very important too. I, I did a, uh, a, a service call on a wind turbine years ago where the harder the wind blew, the less energy was coming through the other end of the battery. It's very puzzling. As it turned out, uh, the customer's husband had pulled the wire through the conduit with a four-wheeler and had skinned most of the insulation off the wire. And when water eventually got into the conduit, they created a, a ground fault. And so the higher the voltage went from the wind turbine, the more punch through, the more pinhole leaks appeared in the wire and very little was getting through to the other end. So um, very important to have the, uh, to protect the insulation, to protect the wire from physical harm, et cetera. And at the bottom picture here, you can see in that, uh, that fusible disconnect, uh, wire management is incredibly important as well because eventually things can touch uh, if they're allowed to uh, to go where they want to go. And if any of you have installed uh, solar arrays, you understand the uh, the importance of wire management, especially up on the roof, where you're probably not going to be able to get back at those wires pretty easily once the uh, panels are mounted over the racking. Next slide, please, Brad. So ground fault protection. There's a couple different parts to ground fault protection. The ground fault detection is the number one uh, part of the, the equation where you need to detect that ground fault. There are several different ways to do it. We have a couple slides on that, but on this slide here, you can see that the solid state circuit uh, shown as that blue band around the wires, that's very similar to how our ground fault protection device works. I believe Brad's gonna cover that in a little more detail later on, but uh, to give you the cliff note version, that's gonna look for inequalities. It's uh, Kirchhoff's law says current going into the circuit should be equal to the current coming out of the circuit and our circuit uh, det our, our detector looks for uh, disparity between the two it's a comparator circuit and uh, I believe it goes down to 300 milliamps uh, it, anything over 300 milliamps will trip it um, then the second part of the equation is the ground fault protection so the detection 
uh, circuitry detects a ground fault, and then it trips the ground fault protection, which opens up a, a breaker and disconnects both the positive and negative PV conductors. And um, and so that's uh, that's that's the basics of it. There are different made methods of, of doing this, uh, different products and so forth, but that's how ours works here at Morningstar. Next slide, please. So this one shows the good old breaker. This is the ground fault protection breaker that first came out. And there's there's nothing really wrong with this except that current codes uh, are getting away from this. They're, they're making this uh, not code compliant anymore. And those of us in the industry that looked at this pretty hard early on said, you know, that's interesting that here's a device that's going to call your attention to a fault in the system by creating another fault in the system because when that breaker when the when the low current breaker on the right hand side senses uh any more than i, I think it's a half an amp in most cases uh, more than a half an amp of current flow on between the the negative battery and ground negative battery uh, uh connection and ground it will trip that entire double pole breaker, which shuts the PV positive off. That's fine, but you also lose your negative bond to ground, and uh, that could create a potential unsafe situation. So, therefore, this this is called a um, a, a uh, reference ground, and solidly grounded systems are exactly that. You have a solid ground connection uh in you know to the uh, to the negative battery side or positive if it's a positive ground system uh which cannot be in it which is not interrupted and cannot be interrupted by the ground fault protection device and that's why the comparator circuit is is really the way to go um, so if you're using a ground fault detection device the dc negative to ground bond is made via that device and nowhere else and that allows it to function that allows it to watch what's happening on that bond and if there's no ground fault device then bonding the battery negative to ground will ground all the negatives including the pv negative and that may work in some cases but it will not alert you to a ground fault it will just shunt the ground the the uh, the fault current into the ground and you may not realize that you've got an issue there until it becomes so severe that you're not getting any energy production and the safety reason is why you want this uh, DC negative to ground bond to bring the negative down to ground potential to reduce shock hazard to personnel. But the other equally important reason is for protection against license, license, yeah, lightning induced surges. And uh, that is that actually works hand in hand here. There are two totally different things, ground fault protection and also the lightning protection. And we'll get into that here in, uh, in just a sec here. Next, next slide there, Brad. I believe this one's yours over to you yeah so thanks Roy yeah this this shows a little more detail about our system so if you remember just two slides back uh, Roy had shown an example of 120 volt AC you know GFCI insulation and really I'm going to talk about that again because this concept is related to that although it's kind of a further generation whereas that was done for AC connections and its primary goal is shock prevention. It's sensitive down to about 30 milliamps generally when you, you get them for GFCI outlets, which you'd find in your kitchen or outdoors or in a bathroom. Um, this actually does DC current imbalance measurement. So it's again, it's electronic detection, but it's for DC systems. And in this case, we actually do it on the array. And uh, the benefit that this has over you know, the, the breaker solution that was just on the previous slide is that we can detect current that is, it doesn't just have to flow through that breaker to trip it, it can actually be flowing elsewhere throughout the system, even taking an alternative path through something mechanical or a wire that's touched a frame of an array on a roof, and we'll still know that it's occurred because the current does not match on the return path. It's an imbalance. That, that current has been lost to a ground somewhere, we don't know where, but we didn't get back what we expected, so we're gonna trip. So that kind of electronic detection is extremely beneficial for safety. Uh, in this case, it is not so much about preventing shock protection in humans, although you know it can certainly help that, uh, but because it goes to 500 milliamps, which is a little on the high side for people, it is much more directed towards fire prevention. It's, you don't want long-term current flowing in places it shouldn't, especially on uh, you know the outside of a building or on a roof. 
and also you want to make sure that uh, it is not only detected but also uh, protected, as Roy had said. So in this case, we've got the same situation here. We've got this uh, this current measurement here for the DC current. It's a lot trickier to do at, at high sensitivity on DC current, but that's in the GFPD module. It's battery powered, which is also a little unique. So it'll it'll run even on off-grid systems. And then when something is detected here, we will actually throw a shunt trip breaker. And with that, we'll take both the positive and negative connection but the ground remains intact. Okay, so that's a lot of the benefits over the, the previous system. The ground remains intact at all times, it's solid, but we will disconnect both the positive and negative of the array, you know, hopefully providing you know, protection and isolation. And we have an audible beeper, so we'll even let you know audibly that something has occurred because it's electronic. Okay, so that's it for, uh, this is Morningstar's GFPD product. Okay, back to you, Roy. Thank you, Brad. So, Earthing best practices here, what constitutes a good ground system? And this this is a subject that can go way beyond what we have the, uh, the space for today. But to give you just a, a rough idea of what you're dealing with here, it all depends on the resistance of the ground that you're using um, as a ground. So there are many different ways to, to ground, and it's, a lot of it's going to be determined by the soil conductivity. The single ground that you see up at the top is very, very prevalent in many cases. If you have very moist soil with, with a, a good conductivity, then that's probably sufficient. Uh, I do know that in many areas that the utility requires two ground rods at least six feet apart with a continuous loop of ground wire, the, the grounding electrode conductor looped. It starts in the main panel, it goes to ground rod number one, over to ground rod number two, and ends in the main panel, all without any splices or breaks. And, and other connections. Um, what that does basically is it, it, it reduces the uh, resistance of the ground system. And uh, if something were to happen to maybe one ground rod or one part of the grounding uh, conductor connecting the ground rods together, you still have a ground. So it's more of a redundancy thing, but also uh, for uh, it reduced uh, uh, resistance so it's improved conductivity now down the bottom there you're going to see that's a u for ground what that is that utilizes the the rebar and reinforcing system that's uh, prevalent in in most all poured concrete foundations so it utilizes that as a very very large ground system that's becoming more and more common especially in um, commercial applications so Copper mats and rings and salt-based soil enhancement, often used in sand or on bedrock. Uh, I've seen a, uh, a lot of places where they've had to blast the foundation into bedrock. You only have a few inches of topsoil, no place to put a good ground there. So they'll lay out a copper grid work uh, in, underneath uh, what little topsoil is there. And sometimes they'll even bring in additional soil to work around that grounding mat uh, that's of a known conductivity to actually improve the ground system. And if you're in sand or some other place where the soil moisture varies a lot, then they'll use a, um, uh, there, it goes under different names, but it's basically a, uh, a salt uh, solution that's it, poured into a, into a tube and it slowly uh, leaches into the ground and it attracts moisture. Salt very uh, pulls moisture into it. And so that helps keep the conductivity uh, uh, pretty high in, the, uh, in, in the, uh, the, the hole where your grounding system is. And recently I had a call, a uh, very good one, they may even be on this call, and if they are, thank you for bringing this to my attention, about the challenges for grounding on Arctic ice sheets. And uh, we, uh, we had a nice discussion about that. That's incredibly challenging. So um, yeah, lots of different methods for grounding. A lot, a lot of it depends on uh, mechanical, but especially soil conductivity. Next one, please, Brad. Oh, sorry. Yep, no problem. So there are a couple of ways you can test the ground. There's probably more than this, but these are the two that I'm mostly familiar with. Uh, you've got a, uh, a clamp-on type meter there shown up at the top uh, that can determine the resistance of your, your ground connection. Uh, the one on the bottom is the one that I've used the most. It works on a f uh, fall of potential. And basically you have the meter there that's on the right and you put a lead uh, onto your ground, your existing ground. So you would clamp onto your ground rod or whatever you're using for a ground system. Then you go out to about 33 feet and another one out to 66 feet. And what it does is it injects a DC signal into the soil uh, instantaneously, just a really quick zap. 
and looks at what the voltage drop is between those different points. Using that, it can extrapolate out as to what the soil resistance is. And National Electric Code, for safety reasons, requires a ground of 25 ohms or less, whereas for lightning protection, uh, that industry usually says 10 ohms or less, and telecom, uh, because of all the RF and sensitive equipment usually requires five ohms or less. Uh, the lower resistance you're trying to achieve, the harder it can be. And again, if you have challenging soil conditions like rock, uh, dry sand, etc., cetera, uh, some of the ground systems can become quite, uh, quite uh, elaborate. So a uh, real quick story here about a, a lawnmower that almost burnt a house down. And this was uh, a customer that I put a solar electric system in for uh, oh, back around the year 2000. And the I, I grounded the whole system into the existing ground bus bar in the home service panel, which is you know allowed by code, which is just fine. And six months later, the owner reported the loss of her refrigerator and electric stove after a nearby lightning strike. She was convinced it had something to do with the magical solar system. So I went down and I was all concerned. And, and of course, you know, anytime you get a call like that when you're in the business, it's, uh, it's disturbing. So it turns out she'd been hitting the ground rods in the existing ground system for the house uh, for years with her riding lawnmower and had cut all of the grounding electrode conductors off. There was no grounding in the house. And that taught me to do a complete survey of the grounding system anytime I worked with an existing ground. And um, check the system integrity. Uh, valuable, valuable lesson, well learned. So uh, next slide. So one of the things that's, it's good to have a good ground. Now you actually have ground rods in the ground. You have, you know, whatever you've got down in there, whether it's a, it's a copper plate, whether it's a mat, whatever. Now you need connectors to tie it all together. And one of the, uh, the, the best ways that this is done is uh, exothermic uh, connections. So this is basically, you have a little mold and it, uh, it starts a, a little high intensity fire and molds uh, actually welds uh, the uh, the brass into the connector and makes a very solid, permanent, irreversible uh, connection. This is done frequently when it's going to be buried. You can't get to this later, unlike a clamp, like a ground rod clamp that has to be checked periodically, and you're not supposed to uh, bury those because they do need to be checked for tightness and for um, corrosion periodically. So this is this is used a lot of times in telecom, commercial wind, and other applications where low resistance connections are absolutely critical, and inspection is probably difficult or impossible. So this is known as a CAD weld. That's also a brand name. There are other brands out there, but uh, in the industry, we kind of use it loosely. And um, uh, everybody seems to know what a CAD weld is if this is this is within your experience. Next, please, Brad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just mention, Roy, uh, a lot of family members in my family throughout the years did uh, railroad work and also uh, the thermite welds, very common way of joining uh, railroad tracks together as well. And, when you and weld in the field without electric. Yeah. In a fun, fun way as well. Yes. But uh, yeah, that's actually a pretty minimal photo right there. I, I've seen them. They, yeah. They really, the thermite yeah. really lights up. So yeah, definitely. So, so dissimilar metals. Um, a lot of us may be familiar with this already. Uh, you put dissimilar metals together, you can have galvanic corrosion. Basically what it does is it sets up a very small uh, electrical uh, current flow. And over time, especially in the in the presence of moisture, even more so in salt uh, environments, uh, can fa fairly quickly uh, corrode uh, the, uh, the metals that are making this connection. Uh, one of the things I learned years ago was uh, solar electric system in boats, there is no ground. And you don't want to ground to the aluminum hull of the boat because that becomes uh, a, a victim of this galvanic corrosion and you don't have a boat for very much longer. So it's uh, something to consider. Noble metals is a term that we use. Uh, a lot of times you'll, you'll see it that silver and brass are not as reactive to other metals, but um, you know, I'm not gonna go over this chart in detail, but there are charts like it out there on the internet you can take a look at and it shows you uh, which metals are compatible, which ones are not. And uh, 
and, and in this industry, let's talk about solar uh, solar mounting. You're looking at aluminum on aluminum rails. You have no problem. Stainless steel works with aluminum. Uh, there's no there's no chance of galvanic corrosion with that hardware. Uh, but if you're mounting to say you are forced to mount to a, a let's say a steel rack of some sort, you're not going to want to put that aluminum directly on that steel rack because it will eat through the aluminum on the on the module frame. So you can use um, uh, separators, fiber washers, uh, uh, stainless steel washers, etc. on that. But um, yeah, there's a lot to this and the cathodic protection industry um, is, is a large industry. You're talking about protecting pipelines and uh, other critical infrastructure. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a big industry and it's an important industry. Bridges, that's a really big one. So, and next one, please. Here's a good example of it. These are both examples of, of um, galvanic corrosion, and um, they uh, and it's hard to say. It looks like that's a probably a um, a steel fastener on aluminum on the left, and uh, looks like it might have been an aluminum fastener on aluminum, but it used a steel washer on the right hand side there. So I think we've all seen things like this, and. Uh, best to know your fasteners, but best to know the material that you're fastening, and best to know which materials work well with others and which ones don't. And this one for lightning protection. Now we mentioned previously that the grounding for safety and grounding for lightning protection are actually two different things. They're actually two different segments in the industry. They share similarities because you can use the same grounding system for both. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to take care of transient voltage spikes, induced surges uh, from nearby lightning strikes. You can try to protect against a direct strike. Uh, good luck with that. Uh, usually there's, there's nothing you can do about a direct strike, but a properly grounded system. What, what you, we used to like to say in the wind industry, when we put up a 120 foot tower, we tried to ground it in such a way and bond it really well to more or less camouflage it, at, at make it look like it's the same um, potential as the surrounding terrain. So it's not this big lightning rod that's saying, hit me, hit me. So the um, what you want to make sure you do not do is to introduce parallel ground paths and ground loops. It's basically a central central point grounding system and with all your ground connections leading to it like spokes on a wheel. Uh, very common to use a grounding bus bar where the, the grounding electrode conductor, that's the wire that comes from the ground system and goes up to the bus bar with, that you can connect to in the um, uh, in, in the main panel uh, and then connect everything into that. And uh, that prevents the, uh, the parallel ground paths. I had a, uh, an inverter when I first put my system in in 1997 here in my house. I didn't understand this. And I found out the hard way after a lightning strike why the screws on my inverter were welded to the cover after the lightning strike, because it had to find it was a parallel ground path through the cover through the the main body of the inverter, and uh, I quickly learned how to avoid that in the future, especially when it costs you money. You tend to you tend to uh, remember that. Uh, another little quick story, I had a tech support customer who was seeing a significant amount of telecom systems damaged by lightning every year. He mentioned it was not common practice to ground or bond anything in these systems and he was wondering if that might be the issue. We had a good discussion on grounding best practices and settled on a course of action which he implemented and I received a follow-up call from him several months later to let me know that since the systems were grounded and bonded, he had not experienced any more lightning damage. So very important, especially if you're in a lightning prone uh, area. And that's it for that. And so surge protection. And again, this is another segment that you could spend a lot of time on and we really don't have the time to go too in, in depth in this. But surge voltage rises very, very quickly during a nearby lightning strike. You're talking uh, some of this nanoseconds. And a good surge protector will grab a hold of this surge and shunt it to ground. And the, so you've got two different types here, normal mode and common mode. And the, the normal mode is you've got the, uh, the uh, 
the phase line, the positive line, whichever you want to talk about, whether it's AC or DC, uh, and then the neutral or non-current carrying conductor uh, flashing over to ground. And then on the other one, it's just the positive going over to neutral. Either way, if you had a surge protector in here that would protect the neutral as well as the phase lines, uh, you can e in a lightning strike, you can equalize that voltage and shunt the excess current over to ground. So depending upon which conductor experiences the surge, uh, the voltage can be common mode or normal mode. And you definitely remember that neutral because many surge arresters only protect the current carrying conductors and the neutral can also rise up in potential during a nearby lightning strike. Uh, next slide, please. So what we have is different types of surge protection devices, uh, but they, they still fulfill two tasks. One, to limit the surge voltage in terms of amplitude. Um, and it, Brad mentioned previously the high pot testing that uh, that we do and all electronics manufacturers do to make sure that you're not going to flash over between the the uh, the case the metal case of the unit and the uh, the circuit board. And as I recall, it's somewhere around 1,200 volts or something like that. I think I think UL. Uh, requires that. And so you want to get a surge protection device that will not allow that surge to uh, exceed that high pot voltage so that the uh, the surge voltage can't uh, arc over and damage sensitive electronics. The other thing it does is it discharges the surge currents associated with surge voltages. So you're going to regulate the voltage in a surge and you're going to dump a lot of current down the, down the wires into ground. So if you think of an SPD as a voltage clamp, that's uh, triggered as a, at a specific voltage, uh, that's probably the best way to, uh, to understand what a surge protector does. And uh, the next one, please, Brad. So this one here uh, shows you the different types. You have a type one, which is broad protection. Type one surge arresters are typically placed where the service entrance comes in, where, where it first enters into the building. So it's your first line of defense. Also has to have built-in uh, overcurrent protection uh, as well. Type two, it's better protection for sensitive devices. Uh, it's used at sub panels that are downstream of the main distribution panel. And a type three SPD is used at the device to be protected. Um, there's also a type four and five, but those are typically found on the circuit boards and self, themselves inside electronic devices and uh, typical to what we have at Morningstar. Uh, we use the, uh, the, the TVSs. And uh, yeah, next one. So here are some internal components to the SPDs. Um, the, uh, these are the most common. There are some others, but these are the most commonly found uh, components. MOVs at the top, metal oxide varistors, uh, again, a voltage clamp, uh, and uh, it will clamp at a specified rating. There are different types of ratings. And um, down the bottom, you have TVS diodes. That stands for transient voltage suppression. And that's typically down more at the component level uh, within, the, uh, within the different uh, devices, such as our charge controllers. So think of these electronic as electronic switches, and depending upon their ratings, most have the potential to limit to, to uh, limit thousands of volts, uh, you know, from getting any higher than your uh, high pot uh, rating, and they dissipate large amounts of current in a very short amount of time. Some clamp to ground in 15 nanoseconds or less, and that's that's pretty quick. Um, the the thing to understand about a lot of these is that. If it's a mild surge, they can take many, many surges, the MOVs especially. Uh, if it's a big surge, it's going to be sacrificial and it's just going to go away and protect the equipment. Um, so very, very important. Um, and again, the the um, I'm not sure, Brad, on this one where we decided large diode arrays, that's uh, kind of outside my range there. Um, and, but common mode chokes for EMI, that's a slightly different uh, subject. I'll just say really quick that um, uh, you can have um, electromagnetic radiation coming out from a uh, uh, from a device, and you can have common mode chokes to cut down on that noise. But that's a little bit about uh, outside the surge protection uh, camp here. So, and that's it for that. And I believe the next is over to you, Brad. Okay, thanks, Roy. Yeah, I know over the many years at Morningstar for myself, you know, the the, the grounding and of course, uh, you know, the transient voltage protection has been a big part of our discussion. You know, how many we put in each product, what they're rated for, how quickly they react. And of course, one of the challenges is you need to keep them 
at a high enough voltage that the system can operate, uh, but not so high that it lets anything in. So there's usually a, a threshold just above the VOC, you know, where those react. And, you know, we've had many support cases over the years and communicating that to customers so they understand exactly, you know, what our products are doing. And that's why, you know, we've, we focus so much in telecom. So with that, um, a little bit of a different segue here into cabling. A lot of our customers in the market, uh, you know, telecom, it represents a pretty broad range of products. And in the past, I would say it usually would refer to large, what we would call macro towers. These are the really large uh, cell towers that you see on a highway, otherwise called the BTS. Uh, those are really um, major power that's being used there, not often solar powered, although they can be in other countries. But in the last many years, we've seen a big influx of small telecom devices, uh, you know, video cameras or, you know, that are sending data over IP, uh, small cellular point-to-point -point radios, the wireless um, ISP market that's providing connectivity, especially in the last many years because of the needs of rural broadband access for education during the pandemic and others and for first responders has grown significantly. So what we're seeing now is a lot of applications for, you know, small under 200 watt loads, uh, maybe even under 100 watts that utilize um, 24 and 48 volt systems, and solar is a, a really good fit for those. Not only for its, uh, you know, reliability because it's independent of the grid, but also you can put it just about anywhere. So with that, uh, a lot of times power over Ethernet is the chosen power supply for this equipment. It's easy to run uh, outdoor rated Ethernet with both power and data going up the tower and connecting to uh, antennas at the top. So. Again, going back to our grounding discussion, uh, you know, these shielded uh, twisted pair connections are used for uh, this connection. And of course, um, there's a patch bay there at the bottom and you can see the ground lead there. If you properly ground that uh, connection point, whether it's, you know, an intermediary patch bay or it's actually a switch itself, inside uh, some of these uh, ethernet connections, there is a small drain wire and that is a connection that you can use that's that's bonded to the shielding and that will not only drain you know EMI which is what the shielding is there for to keep the no, the noise extremely low on these different uh, twisted pair conductors but also to provide you know proper grounding for lighting protection okay so that's just another comment that drain wire can be connected you can ground the switch or the patch bay at the bottom and again better bonding better grounding all around and then the reason you know in order to go from uh, over the years, 100 megabit to a gigabit, and now we've got two and a half gigabit over copper, and I think up to 10 gigabit speeds for Ethernet for our growing hunger for data around the world. The only way you get there is if you're able to send higher and higher frequencies through these same twisted pairs, you know, without going to fiber optics, of course. So uh, with that, um, you get a lot of shielding by twisting those pairs together. You get a lot of protection from, you know, EMI, and uh, it makes for a, a solid and reliable system. So now if you remember earlier in the presentation, we talked a little bit about mixed grounding in systems and we talked about DC to DC converters providing uh, you know, a 24 volt and a 48 volt system on the same battery. Uh, and in those cases, the reason that they can have those mixed grounds is because they are galvanically isolated. They have a, a, an air gap in the design and either through uh, you know, conditions of you know, inductance or sometimes capacitance, they're able to induce voltage and energy transfer across an air gap. So that does not allow any connection of grounded uh, systems. In this case, both the positive and negative are isolated from uh, the other side of the system. And that's how you're able to integrate those mixed grounds. And it limits that voltage. Uh, also in cases of, uh, you, as you'll see with string inverters and in, in systems, you know, 600, 1000 or even 1500 volt systems, sometimes galvanic isolation is also preferred while it's not as efficient, if there were ever a breakdown of a connection or a fault in a device, there could be an errant path uh, to jump, you know, especially with those high voltages through equipment that should not be transferring power. So for safety, occasionally galvanic isolation is preferred in those systems as well, because there is physically not a path for the electronics. If they were to fault, then the transformer, there's, there's breakdown and no conduction will occur. So it's viewed as a lot safer. Okay, and as isolation also relates to communications, you have to handle things a little bit differently. So the goal here is not to you know, conduct or commutate power across a gap, 
it's to send information across a gap, which, which may not always require significant amounts of power, but you wanna make sure that the data does get across there. And in all of Morningstar's products, of course we have Ethernet on many of them with even more to come. That is uh, natively an, an isolated design for communications. Uh, and also we use uh, serial communications and our serial ports are also isolated. And this is kind of a close up view of how we do that. We use optical isolators. So what it is, is we've got a photodiode on the receiving side. We have a small infrared LED, you know, it's not visible to the human eye on the, on the left side. And if we need to send power, uh, I'm sorry, send data across that connection so that we're able to allow multiple devices, potentially with different grounds, to communicate with each other, then we will use this a light to jump that gap from the IR LED to the photodiode, and then it gives you an air gap, so no power is transferred, but the ones and zeros are. And this is really common. Optical isolation is provided standard on all of our products, even going way back to the TriStar PWM. And as I said earlier in the presentation, if you ever do not have an isolated comm system and you have multiple paths to ground, which we've seen many times with some uh, competitors in the market in telecom, uh, you will see very quickly that your uh, comms lines, you know, mainly uh, an RJ45 cable, uh, you know, will melt fast because those are meant to handle comms lines, you know, less than uh, probably a, a half, just milliamps of power, and all of a sudden they're conducting amps. They're very tiny gauge, maybe eight, much as 24 gauge wire. They're not going to handle any kind of a, a current for very long at all. Okay, so that's uh, optical isolation. So that brings us to the end of the presentation. And uh, basically what we've discussed today is uh, the difference between grounding and botting. Uh, we've gone over equipment grounding, which is you know the chassis and the system for protection, just the metal structure versus the, the system grounding itself, which is the, you know, the conduction part, the negative in most cases. Uh, we've talked about both negative and positive ground systems, as well as some that have both. Uh, we talked about ground faults, uh, some of the products that Morningstar has, as well as other devices. Uh, earthing best practices. Thanks so much for that insight, Roy, because you've just you've experienced a lot of those installations yourself firsthand. So thanks for conveying that knowledge to our viewers. And also lighting and surge protection, something that's both added at the system level and is also part of Morningstar's products, uh, you know, at the circuit board level as well. And uh, seeing as we focus on, you know, grounding for safety across all systems, but specifically for telecom, we hope we lended some useful tips and background on uh, best practices for telecom as well. Okay, so thanks very much. And uh, with that, I will go to our final slide and turn this back to Mark McHenry, and we can take some questions. Okay, excellent presentation, guys. Yeah, we do have some uh, questions that came in here. Um, really good audience today. Um, first question from Rich. Let's see. Uh, he says, my academic focus is on reuse of solar PV systems. Occasionally, I come across positively grounded PV modules like SunPower. Is it correct to assume that telecom would be a good reuse application for these modules, assuming no other issues with the modules? Yeah, I, I can. Uh, do, Brad, are you familiar with the solar? Uh, uh, I can panel. contribute, but yeah, why don't you take it first? Yeah, because I, I have a little bit to say here, but go ahead. Okay, yeah, basically that they were, those solar panels uh, were, uh, they had to use those with a positive ground uh, inverter or charge controller simply because they would they would accumulate a positive charge across the face of the, uh, of the panels on the face of the cells. So if you're using it in a positive ground system of any type, uh, they should be fine from my experience, Brad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was actually one of the benefits of SunPower being some of the leading in efficiency from the cell technology was that they had this trait of they needed to dissipate that that energy and they need to be grounded in such a way. I think it could limit their their potential lifetime long term if they were not done in that way. Perfectly fine for all grid connected systems. And because of their efficiency and small size relative to the power, they were really common in our systems as well. And we had some notes on that. So yeah, they, they'd be an excellent fit. But of course, you don't have to have that type of module to use solar in a, in a positive ground system. Regular ones would be fine as well. All right, great. Thanks for that question and answer. Here's another question. And this goes back to the beginning part of the presentation where we had the diagram showing the controller with the um, ground to the battery. So he, the uh, person's asking a question says, uh, just to make it clear, are you saying that one grounding point at the battery's positive pole is enough, 
and there's no need to connect also grounding to the MPPT controller. Well, I can uh, I can grab that one. We can tag team this one, Brad. Um, basically, the answer is th that is incorrect. Uh, you're going to want to uh, ground the uh, the DC negative or positive if it's a positive ground system, and you also need to ground the metal work. There's two different things. We're talking about grounding for safety, taking all the metal work and, and bonding, grounding it to a central ground point, but you're also talking about grounding the DC negative or positive, whichever is applicable uh, for for lightning and surge protection on, on that. So, uh, and also there's some safety there too, because you can have some high voltage, and a lot of people think that the negative side of the system is safe to touch just like the neutral in an AC system and if it's not bonded to ground uh, then it's not safe to touch so uh, so you you would need to ground both yeah and what I'd like to add to this is is Mark you may want to note this question in the contact information because this would be a perfect opportunity to share a positive ground document that we have uh, our mm -hmm. applications engineer uh, Doug Grubbs has done a lot of work in this area and he's got a really good write-up on this as I, I mentioned earlier if you remember we switch in the positive system. So from that diagram, if you're grounding on the negative, that's you can bond combine all those together. Uh, you definitely need to have the chassis ground for safety, as Roy just said. However, in a positive ground system, if you are using our charge controllers, you will want to provide the system ground only at the battery positive uh, and not anywhere else in the system. Like in other words, you do not want to ground the positive of the array separate to that and also the battery at the same time because you will have provided what my previous slide gave an example of is a path around that positive and it will disable the charge controller. So it, it's a little tricky to explain verbally, but the diagram will make sense uh, to you when we send that and I can also follow up with you. So a single point on the positive, if it's a positive ground system and for negative, all the negatives, they can be common because our, our product, products are native, negative ground. Okay, I hope that's clear. Very, very good, I think so. Um, and that there's a link to that positive ground tech note uh, in the slide deck. So if you download the slide deck, you can see that and I'm searching through. It looks like that is on slide 11. Okay, so great, thanks Mark. Go to your handout section and go to uh, slide 11. And you'll see yeah. that. Thanks for marketing for adding that URL in there because it's no like they problem. knew this question would come up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I kind of kind of anticipated that. Um, so great, thanks for that question and answer. Uh, let's see. Um, here's a question coming in. Let's see. This is also early on in the uh, webinar in that block diagram, and I think this gentleman was referring to the block diagram that was, there was a lot going on in that diagram. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can back up to it. I think that's the one, it's probably slide 12, I think. I think um, it's the right. one where you were trying to get across, you just went past it. Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's it, right? Where you were talking about bypassing the uh, the control uh, if you ground it in the wrong place. Well, the, the question here is, let's see, in that block diagram, do you use all N-channel MOSFETs? And channel MOSFETs. Okay, so if he's talking about the MOSFETs, yeah, I see it. Maybe actually this one here. Okay, um, that's the one. Yep. The uh, what's the end channel? I I would probably not be able to answer that properly. I I probably have seen this come up in the past. It does not come right off the top of my head right now. We could get back to you about that because it it has to do with the type of transistor. So I I believe we do, but I'm gonna withhold and and we could follow up with you afterwards. Yeah, because it, it's pretty important. We use several different types of uh, transistors, different package styles, of course, different ratings. You know, we have a new product coming out that has a 200 volt rating uh, product as well. So uh, we could get a little more detail and convey that to you. All right, very good. I see a question from Art. He says, uh, let's see, for his system, which is, I guess, uh, 24 volt battery system, and the array is 190 volts. Um, and this is, uh, he says, for a mobile solar solution, which is on a trailer on rubber tires, is earth grounding needed? That's a sticky one because there have been... Uh, uh solar trailers out for years and years and i know they used to show up at all the different renewable energy fairs and shows and after a while they began to tell them not to bring them because of shock hazards the the short answer is yes you should still ground it uh 
is it is it practical? Is it feasible in many cases, especially if you're going to park it just for a short period of time? I mean, who wants to pound an eight foot ground rod in every time you stop? But think about what could happen if you had a fault, the person walking across the ground and touching the trailer could complete a circuit if you've got a fault in there. So if you find a way to ground it, if it's going to be there for any length of time, like at a show, any kind of an event, uh, you really should try to find a way to uh, to ground that. Okay, very good. Yeah, see. it's challenging. I, I would just say that there's there's probably another whole other presentation we could give on you know grounding when it comes to vehicles, boats. You know, oh, as sure. Roy said, the difference between proper grounding and, and improper grounding is you know you have a, a perfectly safe system or an electronic uh, rust accelerator, <laughs> you know, at work yeah. with your boat hull. So there's a lot of ways that can go um, as well. All right. I see a question from Tony that reads. Let's see, he says, I run an off-grid 48-volt telecom site. We have 61 VDC coming from the earth ground with 5 amps. We have recently moved away from a positive ground system. What could cause this? That sounds like you've got a fault there somewhere. There shouldn't be that much uh, that much current flowing on that ground connection. There's a, either a parallel ground path at work or, or some kind of a fault. It, that's in my opinion. Yeah. All right. Very good. We can follow up more afterwards. I'd like to learn more about that because especially yeah. if, if the system has actually changed recently in terms of wiring, it can become very tricky to isolate right. what exactly is happening. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thanks for that. So let's see. Here's a, another question coming in from, I think it's Mabo, if I'm pronouncing the right, uh, name correctly. Let's see. What are the dangers of bonding AC and DC earthing? Absolutely none from my experience. Uh, they can they can share the same grounding system as long as, you know, you could put a, uh, let, let's say you have a ground mounted array or a rooftop mounted array and you could have a separate ground for each of those, but you've got to run a bond back in the, in the conduit to tie in with the other premises ground, which would be in this case, the AC ground. So there is a, there are provisions in the National Electric Code and other codes around the world to, to use the AC, existing AC grounding system for the DC ground. It's a very common practice. All right, good enough. Uh, let's see, question from Mark here. In Arizona, we had to use a water drip system for an adequate ground. And this might uh, tie into what you're saying, Roy, about the different types of resistance of the soil and whether it's sandy, whether it has water, and or if it's, yeah. if it's very yeah. dry. So this Absolutely. Is if it's not so. super dry, then you use the salt system because it attracts and holds moisture in there. Many, many, many different types of grounds. And um, the, the more challenging the, the type of ground, well, the, unfortunately, the more expensive the system that's needed to be used. Okay, very good. Uh, let's see, moving on here. Ah, okay. Let's see, is bonding earth and neutral a good practice in AC systems? Um, yes, absolutely. It's actually required. Um, you know, again, I realize we're talking to a mixed audience from around the world, but I'm more familiar with the U.S. and Canadian, the North American codes, and uh, you always bond the AC neutral to ground. It's uh, it's required. Mm -hmm. and, it, and in one place, in one place only. When we recently integrated our uh, generator system and our backup application, when we were doing more testing in the PA office, of course, many generators, they use their frame as a, a bond to neutral because they're used to providing power themselves, you know, in a, you know, in a mobile application, but we were connecting it to our system. So we actually had to disconnect the neutral on the generator so that it, it connected to the neutral that was in the system of the building. Right. That's very common in RV systems too. You usually, you, you should have a separate inverter charger, a, a, an RV approved inverter charger in there because when you plug into shore power, campground power, uh, suddenly now you, you're creating a parallel ground path if you don't disconnect your neutral to ground bond in the RV. You now are using the campgrounds single point neutral to ground bond. So yeah, that, that goes out across a lot of different, uh, a lot of different uh, situations. And it, it's a very complex subject. Mm -hmm. All right, I see a question from Ike that reads, let's see, back to the corrosion chart. So I guess this one's probably for Roy. Is stainless steel the least likely to corrode with other metals? It is to a point. 
uh, it is not perfect. Uh, in this particular chart here, uh, let me follow over onto my other screen here while I look away from you folks here. Uh, let's see, yeah, I can blow this up a little bit bigger. Um, on this chart here, uh, stainless steel is actually almost in the middle of the chart. It's not the perfect one, but it's the one that's uh, used most often. And um, the uh, there are some metals you want to avoid with stainless steel. I suggest th that you research that, get on Google and, and look up some of these charts. A uh, lot of good information. In fact, uh, I, I, it's overwhelming how much information is out there as to which metals are used with which. Uh, but in this industry, if you're dealing with aluminum, and uh, and steel and so forth. Stainless steel is definitely the way to go. I've never had corrosion issues with stainless steel, but be, beware if you're on the coast, if you're near the ocean, uh, that kind of goes out the window. It's, uh, you have to take special consideration there because stainless steel can go away too uh, around salt air. Okay. I'm guessing on the on the on the chart here, gold and platinum rank high, but I, I think there's a reason we're not seeing too much hardware used in the field made of gold and platinum. So. Yeah, we only use those on the very high-end systems. Uh -huh. <laughs> the, the Gucci version. Yes. Yes. Of uh, off-grid. Very good. Uh, looks, looks like we have a question from Anthony. And the question is, is there any special consideration for floating PV arrays uh, mount, mounted on floats in a pond or reservoir? I think the same consideration would uh, would be on those as well. It would be the you're, you're still going to need to ground the metalwork. I mean, you wouldn't want to swim over to it and reach up and touch it. And uh, and and you, you could yeah, that could be interesting. Uh, I don't think I'd want to be the one to to touch that. Um, but you can carry that back. You must have a conduit of some sort that comes back with the current carrying conductors, and you can easily carry that ground back to shore and and bond it and ground it there. Okay, very good. I see a question from Leon, and this relates, I believe, back to the slide that I think Brad was covering. Uh, maybe both of you might have covered this with um, um, MOVs and uh, TVSs. Um, so we talked about them. He says, um, why didn't you list GT, GDT search protection? Guest discharge, GDT. Oh, yeah, G that would be guest discharge. D That's right. Yep. T, yes. I, yeah, I almost mentioned something about that. I don't have a lot of experience with those myself. I know they are used in higher end systems. I have not seen any in our installations, but I know they exist. So yeah, but that is a good example. Roy, did you have any comment on that? Yeah, I, I know that they were used a lot. I, I'm a ham radio operator and they were used in some of the, uh, the older ham systems. And uh, gas discharge, to the best of my knowledge, is not quite as effective and not quite as fast operating as the MOVs. I could be mistaken on that, but I believe that the industry was moving away from the gas discharge for that reason. All right, thanks for covering yeah, that good question. Good point made though, that that is a different type, uh, often a very interesting and unique one that, yeah, we did not list. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, I think it's similar to spark gap too, which is basically two electrodes mm -hmm. in beach sand. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Okay, so that was Leon who asked that question. Okay, good enough. We answered that. Uh, question here about the Ethernet cable grounding. Let's see. Why is there bonding only on one end of the cable? Uh, it's, let's see, it's because generally, I mean, it's not to say that it couldn't be, be done at both locations, but it, it doesn't really it's not really conducive at the top of the tower in a lot of cases. I mean, if they have other power run up there, usually the only power supply up is through this. They sometimes will run DC, uh, bare DC terminals up in addition to the ethernet, or if they're running fiber, they have no power. It's, you know, fiber optics, so they have to run data over the fiber, and then they'll run the DC terminals up as well separately. There may be different rules involved in that, uh, but generally I've only seen it caught at this point. Uh, because it would, there could be some potential for some loops there as well, I believe. But yeah, the, the only practice I have seen thus far was just the, the one connection point, and it's usually done at the um, at the end point down at the system in the enclosure at the bottom of the tower. That's what I've seen too. We used to, in, in the solar water pumping systems, we've seen up to 1,200 feet of float switch cable coming back to the controller, and you only want to ground one end because if you if you ground both ends, you have two different potentials. 
the zone two grounds are alike, so you would you would definitely cause a loop. Yeah. Plus, you, when you get long runs like that, I think there's more of a, a possibility of inducing, you know, some currents from that that long wire run as well. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. Thanks for covering that. Let's see. I know there's some other questions we're going to try to get through. I know we're kind of getting to the end of time here, but um, let's see. All right. Um, could you explain mixed ground systems in more detail? Is that something we can explain in more detail? Um, or is it? Is <laughs> I that, think we've discovered our next webinar while. topic, perhaps. Okay. Um, I, I would just say that it, it really just, you have to build it out from the battery. The system that is, that's probably going to drive the system voltage will be, the, if the most power is being drawn at negative 48, and it usually is because that's like a wireless radio or what's often called a RAN, especially in 4G and 5G, the radio access network is what draws the most current. There's other equipment, but it's going to be smaller in power. That's probably going to drive the system voltage, so it would be negative 48 volt. You would ground the positive of the battery. And then if you have other equipment at the site that's going to run on lower voltages, you can just put a DC to DC converter from 48 to 24 to power that equipment. Since that DC to DC converter is isolated, it doesn't care that it's a, a negative 48 volt system and you can ground the other side of the 24 volt, volt output any way you'd like. So that's kind of where this is derived. You can then provide other options, but you know things are getting very complicated. And as I said, if you connect them all with communications as Morningstar often does for our inner device control buses, you just have to be sure that those are also isolated as well, or they go through a isolation providing product like our hub one that is full of the optical isolators that i explained it gets complicated you, you still have to be very careful and you have to mind as i mentioned earlier your breaker locations either switching them to the negative or just putting in two so you can fully isolate those systems um, yeah i'd love to explore this in more detail and i think we covered it in a previous like telecom system solution only webinar and we may be doing more of those in the future so i'll try to make a note to bring this topic up again all right, very good. Let's just do one more quick question, then we'll cut out, and I'll, I'll let people know where they can still contact uh, contact us. Uh, and and if we didn't get to your question, and there are quite a few, um, we will get back to you by email. But one last question here on the webinar we can cover is: Should all connectors and wires be mechanically bonded without any solder? Solder is almost never used uh, in the industry. It actually can create problems. Uh, without going into great detail, uh, you need a good solid mechanical connection. Uh, nothing beats a good solid mechanical connection. Uh, you shouldn't have to solder anything, not, not, for, not for standardized connectors. Okay, very good. Well, I think we've covered it. You want to go ahead into the last slide, uh, Brad, just share that. I think it's a thank Oops. you slide, which has our website looks like we're yeah there we go perfect mm -hmm. um so the website uh, morningstarcorp.com you can go to that um uh and just contact us in the upper right i believe it is to contact us if you have any uh additional questions you need to ask us and um we'll be happy to to uh, uh answer them and of course the ones that you already texted here on this webinar we really appreciate that there's there's quite a few more and we will get back to you by email we already have them so that's very good. So um, please uh, stand by when we end the webinar, there'll be a quick survey that'll come up. And if you could answer that survey, um, that would be very, very helpful. And we'll, we'll see you next time for our next webinar. Stay tuned, look for emails and go to our website, the resources section and our webinar webinars tab. And you can uh, see the additional webinars that we have coming up as well as the recorded webinars that we've done in the past. All right, Roy and Brad, thank you very much. You did an excellent job and thank you audience. If you want to uh, sound off and say say goodbye, Brad and Roy, and then we'll end the webinar. Well, thank you for attending, everyone. It's been a pleasure, and uh, thank you, Mark, for hosting, and yep. Brad for being co-host. Yep, thank you, Mark and Roy. I think this is our our first time teaming up on a webinar, at least in some while, if not. So appreciate it. it. Is. Really uh, uh, value all your knowledge here. I I learned a little myself here, and I'm a presenter. So <laughs> yeah, thanks very much, everyone. All right, take okay, care. Okay, this, this was a lot of Bye, fun. Everyone. We'll see you next time, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.